You are listening to Off the Cuff. Now, here's your host, Adam Banks. I am Adam Banks. Thank you for listening to the show, broadcasting from Lexington, Kentucky, in the Waterstone Studio. It is March Madness, and this is the March Madness series bonus episode. The coaching carousel is what I'm going to be talking about today with my good buddy, Ryan Mullins, who is joining me via the telephone. You guys have heard Ryan on the show before. He's all the way from Knott County, Kentucky, and we've Done the March Madness series a couple of times together, and I'm glad to have him back. <laughs> On this episode, one of the things that I want to talk about is uh, the coaching carousel. And uh, you and me, Ryan, for some reason, we have always been fascinated with talking about coaching changes because this is the time of year where coaches get hired and coaches get fired. And if there's anybody else that I know other than me that keeps up with that, it's you. Actually, uh, you know the assistant coach at Alice Lloyd College, and that's saying something. So you could pretty much probably name any assistant coach in the country in NCAA. I don't know about that. I keep up with it a little bit. Well, I want to start the conversation out uh, talking about uh, Virginia Tech. Uh, you see that they're in the tournament. Uh, they're playing St. Louis. They're over there in the east bracket in the top uh, left-hand side of your bracket there. They play St. Louis, the number four seed. They're coached by uh, Buzz Williams. And I don't know if you have heard uh, the news going around with Buzz Williams, but apparently they are saying that he is the front man to take the Texas A&M job in the, uh, in the SEC. Have you heard that rumor? Coaching job. It's been a year at New Orleans before he left to join Tom Green's staff. I'm like it. But... He didn't have the resources that the other Big East teams did. He didn't. He couldn't compete with the Louisville's, the Villanova's, and all that. But he still managed to compete. You know, he couldn't compete in resources. He couldn't compete in facilities, but he competed on the court. And when the Big East broke up, he, one thing I loved about him was, you know why he jumped to Virginia Tech, one of the big reasons. He was a little happy at Marquette, but one of his main reasons was he wanted to be back in the best conference in America again. He didn't like that all the teams had left the Big East. And that it was the best conference in America again. He didn't like that all the teams had left the Big East. And that it was down to the 10 teams. He wanted to be back where the competition was the fiercest each and every night. Really? I always wondered why he left Marquette. He was a little unhappy, but one of the big things of it was he just really, he was, he loved the Big East. But when it broke up, he didn't like it as much. He liked being tested every single night. He thought he got his players up better being tested every single night. He didn't think he was a good coach playing teams that he should win. Do you think that Texas A&M, the SEC, is that a good fit for Buzz Williams? I like yeah, A&M better back up the bridge truck. I mean, you offer him whatever amount of money they want. Texas A&M is the best job open right now if they'll put the resources behind it because they got the facilities, they got the resources. I mean, if they'll support basketball, that's a better job than you see all day right now. Yeah, Buzz would be the home run Texas A&M. I don't know if Buzz will take Texas A&M. He might wait, but not for Texas. I know Shock is smart. He's been aiming a little bit to try to get out of Texas, and his seat's getting a little warm. So Buzz may wait around for Texas to open, or he might see Texas A&M. And that's a sleeping jack. A&M's a sleeping jack. Well, on, I don't know if you've got a chance to listen to the Selection Sunday show, uh, but I mentioned David Padgett being my first pick for the Texas A&M job. I think that he proved himself that he belonged in the big leagues uh, he coached Louisville for a year after the Patino uh, split, and uh, he had he ended up with a winning record at Louisville. Uh, he yeah. took him to the NIT and uh, took him all the way to the quarterfinals. Yeah. And uh, you know he he of course was an interim coach, so he wasn't hired on as full time. Obviously, Louisville wanted to go with somebody a little bit more experienced. But I think that. Uh, Texas A&M would be a great place for David Padgett to uh, get another try. I wouldn't mind seeing David Padgett at A&M. It, that, that comes back to another question, though. Is A&M ready right now to put everything, which Billy Kennedy went to two Sweet 16s, but he also didn't go to the tournament the other year. No, you're right. I mean, you got to wonder, what do they want right now? Do they want that again, or are they really... 
they spent all the money on Jimbo for football. Are they wanting basketball to be there now? As are they putting all their efforts in? If you do, David Padgett's probably not the guy to go after because he's still got some warnings to go. No, he's still got some growing pains to go through. But if there are at the go for those growing pains, then he may pay off. No, I think Buzz Williams would be my first target. And I'd probably, after that, Brad Underwood's jumped around a lot since Stephen F. Austin. Spent one year at Oklahoma State. I was jumping Illinois, but he would really be a good fit at AM. And Mike Ropes at VCU coached the grass for a few years. You know, knows the landscape of Texas. He's a good coach. He'd fit in good. He's got style of play. Players would like. You know, would be successful in the SEC. Then you know what we also want to got from Mac McMahon at a and He'd be another candidate there. I just don't know if David Patrick would be on the list. I'm a David Patrick fan. I'd love to see him land somewhere. Yeah, I know you're a David Padgett fan, and that's interesting, and it's kind of bizarre to me that David Padgett isn't on anybody's radar right now. I've not heard his name floating around the coaching carousel. Well, I think uh, Rich Stansbury's name's out there a little bit. You know, he's been linked to Texas a and I don't think Texas a and where he lands. You know, he may be ready to move on from Western Kentucky, and I think Stansbury moves on. David Padgett will probably be on the top three list of Western Kentucky. Northern Kentucky's also got a good upcoming coach who could end up being plucked away. And uh, David Padgett, what's his name, John Brennan? Yes. That's good. If uh, you know Padgett could end up landing there too. Yeah, it's um, it's interesting. I've always wondered. It's kind of like a a guy I thought would already be coaching somewhere, or at least I would be hearing more about, but I've not. So I do want to bring up another school that I've heard. Uh, Tossing around a name that you know very well, UNLV. Put to rest the rumors. Is Rick Pitino being considered for the UNLV job? I don't think so. Where did that come from? I think that, I think it comes from he almost took the job years ago when he took the little job. You know, he interviews UNLV in Michigan also. Right. You know, I think some of that's wishful thinking. I think I know Shock is smart. Has had expressed interest in UNLV. I don't know if you know who pay and close to what Texas does. I know Tyrone knows the name has been linked to UNLV. You know, Coach LeBron's the Cavs, has some extra credibility. Mike Miller is hugely interested, but, you know, he's in his first season with Memphis as an assistant coach, never coached anywhere before. Eric Musselman, you know, he's at Nevada, but, you know, he's a better job than Nevada. And Jason Kidd's the name here. I mean, I think Thad Motto's the name to look out for at UNLV. That model's probably the guy who lands that job if he don't land UCLA. Which I've been hearing that model. My Copkins are very hot at UCLA right now. What name's going around? Thad Mata at UCLA. Yeah. Thad Mata, my Copkins are two names picked up today. You know, it may not happen, but that's a very hot name. It's been discussed at the moment. Tony Bennett's also a name been attached to UCLA, and I've seen on your Wild Card Sports blog that you are not a fan of Tony Bennett going to. UCLA. You said that's a bad move for him. Oh, no, I'd love for him to go. Uh, do, I'm losing. I'm losing to him. <laughs> well, I mean, so for, as a fan, personally, you'd I like to see him leave. Is that a good business move for him? No. Well, he's, you know, UCLA, style of play he plays is not what they want at UCLA. Although I think it's the point now where they would schedule for 30 to 29 games if they win. Tony Bennett, he's, he's got Virginia exactly where he wants it. Well, I'll leave that for UCLA. Well, UCLA. Uh, on the West Coast. Hey, say what you want about see what you want about UCLA. It is an attractive job. It's out on the West Coast, yes, but it's also in LA. Um, if you're the head coach of UCLA, you're going to have money, and who don't want to have money living out in LA? Um, anybody else you've heard being attached to UCLA? Really? 
John Calipari, uh, if he was going to leave Kentucky for another college school, it would be UCLA. I couldn't see him leaving for another school. And it would be, uh, there would be a motive behind it. Uh, it's not nothing to do with the pro- with the program itself. I think it would just be to get closer to LA to do other ventures. I don't know if he was maybe thinking about doing like going into TV or broadcasting or something like that. But he would have a motive uh, of taking the UCLA job and leaving Kentucky. If John Calipari went to UCLA, it would try to happen. I'm safe. To say, I feel confident that it won't happen. But if he did, it would be a move similar to LeBron James. It wouldn't be so much about the teams. It would be about himself, his family, a career after sports possible. Yeah, I agree with you. Um, but I think that John Calipari, uh, as of right now, I would it, it would come as a shock if he left Kentucky. Yeah, I, I just got a feeling you said they wanted Mike Hopkins. I might be dead wrong. It's just the gut feeling I'm getting. They're wanting to take I, their time. Yeah, I could absolutely swing and go a different way. I mean, if they hard Mike Hopkins, he's probably going to both Syracuse in three or four years. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, why would you want to do that? <laughs> well, I mean, hard somebody to say. I don't know who that'll be. Fred Hoiberg was the name, but I think he's more interested in the Nebraska job, so it come up. Speaking of Syracuse, did you hear about Jim Boheim running over that guy and killing him? Yeah, he played Louisville that night. Yeah, he played Louisville. He was leaving the game. And uh, I don't know exactly what happened, but I think that the car was broke down and the guy was on the outside of his car and Jim Boheim didn't see him and ended up hitting him on accident. Is that what you heard? Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell you another thing to watch out for in coaching search will be Ben Howell. You know, it's, not, it's probably not going to happen in Washington State. I think it's going to be Boise State and Leon Rice. I'm going to be surprised anybody else gets hard load. But Ben Howell does have some interest in the Washington State job. You know, it's probably the worst job in the Pac-12. Why you say that? Well, it's been to the NCAA tournament three times since 1983. So yeah, but took them twice of that. yeah, but you have to put that a little on the coach, don't you? Well, some of it goes on the coach. You know, when you're playing in a town that makes Morehead look like Cincinnati. <laughs> <laughs> the town's smaller than Morehead. Speaking of Cincinnati, I've often called them the city of losers. They typically never go anywhere. Uh, how far do you have them in your bracket this year? Uh, they're, they are located in the Midwest. And uh, it looks like that. I don't have them going. Yeah, of course I don't. I have them losing first game. I got them losing Tennessee. Yeah. And how far you got Tennessee going? You think? And one name, yeah, he's trying. His seat's getting warm at Texas. He needs a reset. He knows he needs a reset. That's why right. he's pursued. He's already reached out to LSU. His people's at LSU. No, he's interested. He thinks LSU's the same kind of dog as Texas, a football school where he can find the radar. He just not, not been working out at Texas. But you know, but thing is, he will try heavily to get Virginia Tech job. But Virginia Tech, I can, I've heard from people I trust. Steve Wojnarowski will be the top choice there. Should Buzz leave? I don't see Virginia Tech being a very attractive job, but it's not. Yeah. It's the worst job in ACC with Buzz gets there. Yeah. And so does Wojnarowski? Wojnarowski knows that market. Does he want to do what Buzz did? Step up in the competition with about the same resources, or is he happy where he's at? Yeah. Of course, Virginia Tech will pay better. But Shock is smart right now. Just want a reset. He can get a reset anyway. If he gets a reset successful two years at Virginia Tech, he can jump right back to the, the job that he really wants again. I just never so, seen the big appeal with Shaka Smart. Every, everybody was always about Shaka Smart. I know he had one good year where he went to the Final Four, and they are always talking about that one season he had. What else has he done? Well, about Archie Miller. He took you back to one season at Dayton to the Indiana job, and that's a move that needs to be made. What a mistake. Oh, if Indiana made a mistake, it was hiring Archie. Yeah, I mean, I would cut that right now. 
Who would you put in there in place of Archie at Indiana? Because that is probably uh, historically a top 10 program. Uh, I would say even now top 25. But who would you put in there at Indiana? Well, I think Buzz Williams is one name you'd have to consider on the list. But I would go after Mike Bray. If I was Fred Glass there, that's left for Jimmy Ennis. And he's had great success in other thing. He's up down here this year. You know, give him the resources and the commitment to basketball. Do what he should do. He knows the area. He may be ready for a change of scenery. Sometimes people want to change the scenery. Yeah, they do. He's been there for 20 years. Yeah. They want to step up, try to rebuild power house. And sometimes people also wonder, well, why did they leave this school for that school? Because uh, uh, this school seems, the school that they're at seems like a much better school than where they're going. There's always a reason why people move. You never know the behind the scenes reasons of why people are leaving. They might be going to work for a school where their buddy of 15 years is the athletic director. Yeah, they may not get along with that athletic director they got. Exactly. Sometimes, you know, things may not be going right. You need that reset. You feel that you can see. You just need to get out of where you're at and completely reset everything. Shaka you know, does need it. Shaka lands LSU job. He's reset for four years. He's got three to four years again. Start over and kind of go. Sometimes coaches need that. Surely UCLA won't make the mistake of hiring Shaka Smart. I meant to say LSU. Oh, okay. <laughs> coaches in the country. I mean, really, he's one of the best upcoming coaches in the country. I, I would he agree would with been, that. He would have been at Kentucky, Duke, North Carolina, or Kansas, something like that, within 15 years. If all this wouldn't have come up, man, that's how good a coach he was. He's the next guy to get one of those big-time jobs. You know, Chris Mack was kind of local jobs. So that's off the board. Kentucky, Duke, Carolina, those are coming open. They are coming open. They're, uh, Roy Williams, Coach K, they're not getting any younger. I know that uh, Coach K's, what, 73? You know, Luke was off the board for hopefully 20 years. You know. <laughs> There's still a few on there. Are you happy with Chris Mack and his performance so well? Yeah, Chris Mack was – I think Luke got lucky. Arizona, if they have to make a change, Joe Hewitt going to – Luke will come. If they had no scandal and Rick Pitino had won a national championship and retired, they wouldn't hard better coach than Chris Mack. He would have been, you know, top target then. But they just got lucky that Louisville was Chris Mack's dream job. And no matter what the scandal that was going on, he wouldn't want to say no to that job when it came his way. You know, that was very lucky. Yeah, I mean, he benefited from it. He's glad it happened. I bet you he's got a picture of Katina Power up beside his bed. He can thank her for his job. But Chris Mack, I do like Chris Mack, but what is the deal with his closing skills? Because I've seen Louisville in two or three situations this season where they had a good 15, 20-point lead on a team, and then they just lose it. They, they, they collapsed. They lost a little-point lead to Florida State. It ain't Chris Mack, it's the players. I mean, starting backcourt, starting – you know, one played at Sanford last year, one played at Richmond. And you start pressing them with the much more talented players. And, you know, it, it got to them. The pressure's got them a few times. They just ain't had the ball handlers. But, you know, Max worked with them, and the last few times they've tried that, it's not worked. You know, they've closed out. Or even when they ain't won the games, they lost to Virginia and North Carolina to the last three games. But North Carolina or Virginia wasn't able to make pressure on all the states that the other teams had. They seem to have figured that out. But if they didn't, it's Matt can't do nothing but them up on the floor. He can't make the plays. You know, you got guys just falling down, handing the ball over, throwing the ball back under the basket. So that's guys who's played four years and have not been. I love Christian Cunningham. He's a great point guard. Think first, but Scott Patrick apparently didn't teach him all that he needed to out there at Sanford. Yeah, Cunningham played. Cunningham played in Knott County in high school. Played for Roger Crowe's Cordy. I watched him over at Knott County Center. <laughs> you know, he played Henry Clayton too. He just wouldn't press against those kind of athletes. You know, they have adjusted to it, but he gets it hurt. And they panic against Duke. And the confidence got them a few times too. I think they were, after it happened twice, they figured they couldn't do it. And they had to wait till he did do it again to get the confidence back. 
Well, Louisville and Kentucky are not the only two teams in the tournament. You also have NKU, which I was glad to see get in. This, I believe this is their second tournament appearance two years in a row. And then you got Murray State, who won the OVC, and they have one of the top players in the entire country. Uh, could you see Murray State making a run? Because I will tell you this. I have Murray State in my Sweet 16. I got them upsetting Florida State. Well, if you look at that little pod down there, you know, you got Murray State versus Marquette, Florida State and Vermont. Any of those four teams can make the Sweet 16, I believe. I would not be shocked for any of those four to be in the Sweet 16. That could mess up some people's brackets. You know, the winner of Marquette Murray could beat the winner of Vermont and Florida State. I, mean, I could definitely see that. And I think Vermont, Vermont's a good team. Vermont's a real good team. So, you look at those, that's one little pod for any of the four teams go to Sweet 16 that would not be surprised. Yeah, I think anything can happen in that West bracket, especially if Gonzaga goes down. I mean, you're opening up a situation here for anything to happen. I've even got NKU going in the uh, – let's see, they're in the third round. I guess that would be considered second now. Uh, but I've got them facing Florida, and I've got Florida going to the Elite Eight to face Gonzaga. Um Mike White, I think that uh, I'm I'm a big fan of Mike White. I think you are too. Uh, he was the son of Duke head. Let's see, who's he the son of? The athletic director at Duke. Yeah, his dad's athletic director at Duke. Yeah, his first coaching job was at Georgia Tech, and now he's taken over Florida. Louisiana Tech. Was where? Oh, Louisiana. That's that is correct. Louisiana Tech, and now he's at Florida. I think that's a great job to have. I thought that uh, Richard Pitino would have got that job, but I was hoping Richard Pitino, but I'm a Richard Pitino fan. I hate after the game on Thursday. That's going to be one of the most interesting games of the entire tournament. That is actually the game that opens up the tournament. Do you know that? Yeah, yeah. And you know Minnesota's the best rebounding team in the country. Jordan Murphy is one of the best rebounders in the country. Oh, Ryan, let me tell you something, Richard Pitino. I know you're a Louisville fan, but I also know you're a Richard Pitino fan, and you're cheering, you're cheering for, you're cheering for Louisville. Don't get me wrong, I know that, but you do have to be cautious playing Richard Pitino. I've watched him coach. He is a hustler as a coach. I mean, he will fight for every play with the refs. I mean, he he doesn't stop coaching. He coaches from the time the ball is tipped to that final sound buzzer goes off. He's outstanding, and he is his father's son. We just talked about Louisville having issues closing games and things to press on. How much do you think uh, Richard Pitino or James want to press? Well, let me ask you this. Is Rick Pitino going to be present at that game? I would doubt it. I doubt it. I don't know. I, I team plays Thursday in Greece. I could see him sitting it out. I could see him letting his assistant do it. Why? I mean, look, it's his son. His son has never made it to the second round of the tournament. So he wants to see that milestone happen, and he wants to be there. I would love to see Patino there sitting behind his son in Minnesota gear. Would the fans of Louisville boo him if that happened? Uh, I wouldn't, but I can't speak for anybody else. And what would you expect? It's his son. I think I think they would boo him because of what happened. I don't think, um, just in light of everything that happened with all the scandals, I think that if he retired gracefully from Louisville and he went and sat behind the bench at Richards' game, I think they would be fine. But I think the fashion that he left Louisville, I don't think that would be in good taste for him to do that. But I, I couldn't blame him if he did. But Tino wasn't tied in any of that look. I mean, six people have testified in federal court that Rick Pitino had no knowledge. And these people got immunity, granted that they told the truth. So are they going to lie to cover Rick Pitino and they can go to prison? Are you talking in terms of the Adidas scandal or? The Adidas scandal. The Adidas, okay. Never proven innocent. It ain't <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to bring up any, like, bad memories or anything. I know that you're excited to have Louisville back in the tournament. It's been a couple years since you've got to watch them. Last year they were in the NIT. The year before they self-imposed and didn't play. No, they played the year before. Oh, did they play? Okay, when did they self-impose? The year before that? Uh, three years ago. Okay. They set out two of the last four years. 
And it's just unfortunate. I think it's an unfortunate situation that they had to play Minnesota. Of course, the committee did this on purpose. They're always trying to set up games for entertainment reasons, too. It's television. So when they saw that they had an opportunity to put Louisville in Minnesota, they were like, okay, that's better than you know Louisville and Cincinnati. Let's do, let's do Minnesota. Actually, Louisville Cincinnati would have been a good game. I mean, it was uh, former conference rivals. Yeah, we had major conference travels. And two of those top five college basketball markets in America, like, would have been a, that would have been a good matchup. I don't know. I don't think anything could be better than this Minnesota Louisville first game matchup. Well, I think it's unfair that Richard Pitino will. I think it takes a lot of focus off of him and his team and the job he's done. It does. It could go one of two ways. It could, if he loses. I feel bad for the guy, but if he wins, I mean, look what he has accomplished. He beat the school that fired his father. He gets a little bit of revenge, and he also gets a milestone career uh, by going to the second round. So uh, he could – it could be a big moment and for the biggest, Patinos. I mean, if you really look at it, he's going to be the team that starts for more transfers. I mean, it's not a powerhouse school team, but it's a good school team. It's still a little team, like how far do you have Louisville? How far do you have Louisville going in your bracket? I'm a homer, so you don't know how far I got them going. I got them going to the Sweet 16. If you ask me how far I think they go, it seems Louisville gets beat every year by Michigan State. Every year it seems, and Louisville beat Michigan State. You know, Louisville and Michigan State's played. Six times since 2005, times since 2009. And either, either NCAA tournaments or other tournaments. You know, that's a lot. What? <laughs> Louisville beat Michigan State earlier this year. But it'll be hard to do it again. Louisville plays better against teams who's not solid. They're a little unorthodox. I wouldn't want, but you know, Louisville played Tennessee too. But I thought Louisville's better than Tennessee for that game. It's 36 minutes, Louisville's better than Tennessee. A couple of technical sling that game around. Tennessee won. I would have done the pass. I stuck with them again to Michigan State, even though we beat Michigan State and lost to Tennessee. Do you have Michigan, Michigan State winning that bracket? No, I got Duke coming over. Okay. I was wanting to hear that story if uh, you had somebody else besides Duke coming out of the East. Okay, no, down in. Michigan State beat Belmont. Go to the Elite Eight. Belmont in the Sweet 16. Which, you know, Rick Burge never won a tournament game, so that kind of scares me. He'd have to win, you know, three times to get to the Sweet 16, or even the first four. And he's never won before. One of the most, I think, exciting uh, – I wouldn't really use the word exciting, but I would say the bracket where anything could happen is down there in the West. Who do you have winning that West bracket? You're going to tell me, tell me the number one seed. Gonzaga. I, I got a homemade bracket here. I wrote it down with pen. <laughs> you got to do what you got to do. This is, I think you're right. I think it's the most wide open bracket. I mean, if you look at it, I was looking at the teams that I got winning the first game. I mean, Gonzaga, Syracuse, Marquette, Murray State, Florida State, Vermont, Buffalo. Yeah. Texas Tech, Nevada, or Michigan. Don't be surprised if, Gonz- if Syracuse don't upset Gonzaga. I got Syracuse upset Gonzaga. Yeah, it could very much happen. I, listen, before I turn this bracket in, I might not have Gonzaga going to my Final Four because right now I do have him in the Final Four. Uh, they've only lost three games, but Gonzaga plays in that crappy conference. Uh, they play out there in the West. It's, it's not a basketball region, so... When they are put to the test against schools like Syracuse, I don't think they can conquer. No, I'd have to say it. I mean, in re- really, they could get upset by Murray State, even. Well, you know, that has to be, that would be a little further up there, but yeah. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me. Yeah. Murray State's got a guard. I mean, Shabazz Napier proves, I mean, I know Kimball Walker did it, but Shabazz Napier did it for a lot lesser team. One guard can win. And I tell you, two other teams got a guard like that. You all going? You're a Kentucky fan. You're going to see him probably. That's Miles Powell, Seton Hall. You've seen him once already. A little play that Seton Hall. Beat him. Miles Powell can carry a team to a victory. Do you market power to market and do the same? Do you think that 
Wofford is going to get beat by Seton Hall. Wofford is on like a 26-game winning streak. Yeah, I know. Wofford's a good team. They're legit. They are. But Seton Hall. I go Seton Hall now. I'd like to see it be Seton Hall. I don't think Seton Hall could beat Kentucky two times in a row. That's, that's all Miles Powell. He shoots. The, I mean, he's one of those players that when he starts hitting, he's going to carry the team to a victory. Uh, you, when know, when you can hit falling out of bounds, sling sideways, throw it up, bounce it off your head, everything else, and go in for a three. It's the, the Midwest bracket's interesting. Uh, comparing the top and bottom, I do like where Kentucky is. You know, me, me being a Kentucky fan, I'm rooting for them to go all the way. I do like their chances. Uh, I think that, uh, yeah, I think that their path is is pretty outstanding. I see them definitely taking down the Albany Christian. Um, you say you say Seton Hall. I say Wofford. I see them taking down either two of those, and then I got Houston out there. And then, of course, I got UNC beating Kansas, so I got Kentucky and UNC. And Watch out for Iowa State, though, over Houston. Iowa State over Houston. I do have Ohio State uh, beating Ohio State and then playing Houston. Why do you like Ohio State in that one? I said Iowa State, though. Iowa State, they just, they're a good, scrappy little team. I mean, I got Houston winning, too, but that could be an upset. Who do you have winning the Midwest? I got Carolina. Do you have them beating Kentucky? Yeah. You don't think that uh, Kentucky can beat North Carolina twice in one season? Oh, yeah, they absolutely can. Don't be surprised if they do. It's you know, entirely possible. Since, since that little boy, North Carolina, Carolina's been a different team. They're, they're clicking. Also, it's also another storyline. A rematch, Elite Eight rematch from back in 2000. 16, 17, whenever Luke May made that buzzer beater three point shot over De'Aaron Fox. You know, that right there, uh, fans have been wanting revenge. People say Luke May is the modern day uh, Christian Leitner. Yeah. I mean, I don't think, I don't, I wouldn't go that far. Uh, I think there was. What if he does it again? If he does it again, yeah, I think he, he could be in the running. Of, of, being the most hated man in Kentucky. If he did it again, good God. Yeah, people would hate him more than Leitner. I tell you, the South region, the thing that, you know, interests me the most in that is, other than Villanova, you're going to find a team that's probably going to go to the Final Four for the first time in a long time. If Villanova don't go out of there, Virginia's not been in years. Tennessee's never been. You know, you're probably going to get the Purdue. I don't know when the last time they won is. Unless Villanova comes out to six seed wins, the team that's been on a major drought or never been to the Final Four is coming out of Well, Villanova is an experienced team in the tournament. Uh, they are the defending champs. Uh, I like Nova in this bracket. I've got Nova upset in Tennessee. I know a lot of people got Tennessee in the uh, Final Four, which I think Tennessee, they, I think they're losing their momentum. They're losing their touch. Coached by Rich. Uh, Rick Barnes, who I feel like has done a great job. Not as good as what Bruce Pearl had him at one point in time, but he is doing a great job. But I do have Nova upset oh, in Tennessee. I agree with you. Bruce Pearl's best coach Tennessee is that. He put him on the map. Yeah, Bruce Pearl, uh, I like Bruce. I'm glad to see Auburn win the SEC championship. I'm glad to see Bruce Pearl back in the SEC. Uh, and I'm hoping he makes a run. You know, Bruce what? You know, the year before he got to Tennessee, this 14 and 17. He went 22 the first year, and he just kept building off of that. But, you know, Villanova, I got Villanova beat Tennessee also. Then I got Villanova losing in Virginia. I got Virginia finally getting out there. Yeah. But Virginia <laughs> worked me the second game. And it seems every year I look at a game and say, oh, my God, that game with two shitty teams, that game was going to suck. And it seems like every single time, one of those teams of that game, I say, is going to suck. Get to the Elite Eight or Sweet 16 or something. And I look at Oklahoma and Ole Miss, and I say, that game is going to suck. <laughs> and the winner of that place, Virginia. So that worries me. Virginia is definitely not going to go. Virginia is not going to go down as early as what they did last year, losing to the 16 seed. I don't even know if we'll see another 16-1 uh, matchup like we 
did against uh, UMB, UMBC in Virginia. I don't know if that'll happen again for a long, long time. It'll happen again. It'll never happen. Now it'll happen. It may happen every year. Right. It's like breaking the seal. I love mine. See, but it comes back. <laughs> it very much could happen. Who is your first number one seed to fall? And that makes sense. So let's talk about Oklahoma and Ole Miss. You know, I don't really think there's that many snubs this year. I think Lipscomb should have been in. Lipscomb won at SMU, at TCU, beat Vermont at home, pushed Louisville on the road. Only one bad loss is for the Gulf Coast. Lipscomb was the team I thought was going to win. But, you know, I said you couldn't leave any team. I mean, I don't see how Oklahoma made it. But outside of Lipscomb, who would you going to put in? Alabama. I mean, they're hot garbage. Clemson's hot garbage. NC State had a few good wins, but every time they needed a big win, they faltered and lost. I mean, who else are you going to put in? I don't think Oklahoma should be in, but I get looking. No, Alabama, Greensboro, Clemson. I mean, who the hell are you going to put in? I mean, I agree with you. The uh, brackets here, when I look at my bracket, it's pretty chalky. And I told somebody before I could play hot, uh, hopscotch with my bracket this year because there's a lot of chalk dust on here. I think the committee did a good job. I think they might have got it right this year. Best of ever done. Best of ever done. I don't what know. About Yale and Yale plus you. No, that's a game I'm paying attention to. Yes. Tell us you had Will Wade. You know, I had Will Wade out there. Yes. Will Wade. That's one of my key games as well. The Ivy League never disappoints. And you sure don't like Johnny Jones, do you? He's horrible. He is pretty bad. Andy Kennedy is better than Johnny Jones. I'll give you that. I did brag on Andy Kennedy on the Selection Sunday show. I said that uh, he's somebody I'd like to see get back into coaching. Right now he's uh, he's on the announcing booth. But I would like to see Andy Kennedy... At least back into a small conference like the OVC, possibly. I mean, he did have a winning re- he did have a winning record. It was Tennessee Tech. He had a winning record in the SEC and overall as a head coach. I mean, he's not so bad. I think that Mississippi or Ole Miss was a little bit too big for his britches. I think he would be more suitable in the OVC. If Ole Miss is too big a job for you. <laughs> <laughs> what? I tell you, I tell you, folks, it absolutely shocks me. It got far. It absolutely should not have been far. as Marvin Mincy at UNLV. I mean, how they far him with the mess he had to take care of? Him. He finally got stability, and they far him. It's all about wins. Ultimately, uh-huh. ultimately, it all comes down to wins. So he wasn't he winning. That fourth year. He mm. wasn't winning. He's dealing with the mess. They're desperate. I understand. The fan base is putting pressure on them, and they're desperate. They're wanting somebody else. Marvin Mincy will get hard somewhere. He'll do a good job. He's been a good coach. Yeah, there's a lot of names out there that are – there's a lot of people out there that are still available. Um, the guy who just got fired from UCLA, Steve uh, – Steve Alford. Steve Alford, yeah, he's, he's available. Where's his next stop? Indiana would go after him again. But, you know, Indiana reached out to him two years ago. I know, and you got to think about that too, missing your train. And there's people that we've talked about on this show, uh, people like Greg Marshall and uh, people who have been really – their names have been hot on fire, and everybody's been talking about bringing them to their school. You know, I think Alabama went after Greg Marshall, offered him a big contract. Um but he he turned him down, and now you don't hear anything about him. I think if the train's going by, if you want to jump on, you better jump on because eventually it's going to pass you by. Yeah, but sometimes you're really happy where you're at. And you don't want to. It's either that or he's waiting on one of those North Carolina jobs, one of those Duke jobs, because like we said, uh, yeah, he that. those guys are getting older. And I'd like to ask you, uh, Coach K's pushing – 74, 75. Who's the next person in line to take Coach K's spot? Possibly the greatest of all time. One of the hardest 
positions to fill? Probably Jeff Capel, if he can have success at Pittsburgh. You know, he's got to have success at Pittsburgh. And I don't mean that be national champion or anything like that. They loved him at Duke, and the administration loves it. It could be a different administration. You know, Coach K kind of wanted Capel to stay there and be his coach and wait instead of taking the Pittsburgh job. You know, Capel wanted to be a head coach again. He'd have success. So that's probably who he'd recommend. You know, you got to remember, Florida's my class. Dad is the athletic director. So, you know, that'd be the reach down there. I, I wouldn't be surprised if they did reach out to Mike White. Yeah, but, you know, that would, that would put you in a hard situation if you don't. It would. I know it's a conflict of interest with his dad being the athletic director. I don't know if that could happen, but uh, yeah, it, can happen. it can, so he could hire his son. He could hire him. Well, unless Duke got it. It's not forbidden by the NCAA. It could be forbidden by Duke. North Carolina, Coach Williams is getting old as well. Who do you see taking his job? I've heard Hubert Davis, but I just don't see that. I have to see it to believe it. So you don't see people like Greg Marshall coming back into talks when uh, that those jobs open up? Uh, he doesn't have more success. I don't think he'll get back into them as of right now. You know, as of right now, you might get Chris Beard in it. And what about and what about people who are who have had success at other programs like Jay Wright at Villanova, who really wouldn't be making a horizontal move? Uh, but anytime you go to UNC, Duke, a place like that, you are going to a relevant top five college basketball program. So they could pretty much rip you almost from any program, even Bill Self from Kansas. But, uh, I don't think you get Bill Self from Kansas. I don't think they'd want him. You know, he's got to go that's Kansas. Duke's a funny thing. You know, are, are they a basketball powerhouse for Scott Cade? Somebody else is going to have to do something to keep them there. If you know what I mean. I think they're a basketball powerhouse. I thought about that, actually. I um, they'd be like UConn. UConn, been, you know, UConn had a fluke national title under Kevin Ollie. Basically, they ain't been anything since. No, and I thought about yeah. UCLA. Uh, but I don't even, or I'm sorry, um, who are we talking about being a top? Duke. Duke. Yeah, I've thought. I've thought about Duke being a uh, a top program in general of college basketball. I definitely think Duke's the top five uh, of all time basketball oh, yeah. program. Uh, Coach K obviously made them that way, but they are going to have to have success post Coach K too. If I was an athletic director at Duke, I'd go hard Johnny Jones. <laughs> uh, he's got jokes here on off the cuff. Or Johnny just let a year ago. Let a year ago. But don't let some. Don't make somebody follow Coach K. Bring in the worst possible coach ever. Fire him after a year, or then bring a good one. <laughs> don't make somebody follow Coach K. That's why. I, that's why I say it's probably going to be somebody like Cape. You know, Capels. But Capels not really has been very successful when he's filled in for Coach K. I see what you're saying. You're setting people up for failure almost if they follow Coach K. I mean, how would you like to be a football coach who follows Nick Saban? Oh know. God, yeah, it'd be awful. And uh, you talk about Jay Wright. I think there's one job Jay Wright needs to go over for. Which I'm is? Outside of Kentucky. I don't think he'll go anywhere else. Which is? Kentucky. So I said outside of Kentucky. Oh, outside of Kentucky. So you think that Jay Wright would leave yeah. Villanova for Kentucky only? Yeah, I think Kentucky would probably go away. I don't think, think Chris Mack was leaving Xavier for anywhere but Will. We got offered more money at Ohio State and the same might be Indiana. And we have no interest. I think Jay Rapp would be the same Kentucky. But well, Jay Rapp built his own program willing over too, so he may just not want to follow somebody else. Any other key games that stand out to you in this tournament? You know, there's a few good games. I was, you know, I think UC Irvine and Kansas State could be a good game. I think Irvine could pull that one out. Kansas State. Ugh. I'm still bitter at them from them beating Kentucky off free throws last year. And you got a Georgia State team again. You know, the bad thing is there is Ron Hunter. You know, don't have a broke leg, they can be rolled around on a chair. <laughs> I'm so glad that he's in the tournament. He makes the tournament better being in it. Marquette Murray State's going to be a good game. Yeah. Of course, Clayton Vermont could be a good game. Louisville Minnesota could be a really good basketball game. You take away all the. 
Oh, I think it's a great matchup. I think Minnesota Louisville is a great matchup. I think that will be one hell of a basketball game. I can't wait to watch that. But you know, Minnesota's also got a former Louisville player, so that's one of those games where you know he's going to be welcome to. Who's Mark that? Stockman. Mark Stockman, backup center from Minnesota, played at Louisville for three years. And, uh, you know, but you know, everybody talks about Rick Pitino. No. This Louisville team so well, he could help Richard. Eric Tino's only coached three players in this Louisville team. He coached VJ King, Ryan McMahon, and Akoya Gal. And when he coached Akoya Gal, you meant, it's funny, you mentioned 2014 so 2013 14 season was the last time Akoya Gal played at Louisville before this season. He transferred to Georgetown, then transferred to SMU, and is now transferred back into Louisville. That's interesting. But Rick can't coach none of these players. He recruited them, but he's not coached them. Rick Patino, uh He recruited some of them. He recruited some of them. They start three guys that Rick didn't recruit. I can't wait to see Rick Patino at this game. It's going to happen. <laughs> he's all about making the news. He's all about... Does he want to do that to his son? <sighs> that, that's the thing. I mean, I, I do think he does have morals. If Minnesota wins now, he's probably the next game. Now, I'll get eight alive for my statement. I said I think Rick Pitino has morals. Now, people will say, Rick Pitino has morals? <laughs> yes, I do think the man does have morals. I think when, no, it comes to his, when it comes to his family, I don't think he's going to want to take any attention away. Other than sleeping with that woman on a restaurant table, <laughs> you know, he's showing pretty good morals. He's a human being. I'm not going to pass judgment on him. Because the people that pass judgment on Patino for doing that would do it too, or they have already done it. I was joking. I just said, he did, he, everybody gives him a bad time for all the civil stuff, but he's not been proven in any of it. I mean, that's the only scandal that's came up that he, you know, was proven complacent in. That is absolutely true. Well... Ron, I want to thank you for taking the time out of your night to come do a show with me. We're going to have to get you in studio. That's going to have to happen. Yeah, I'll get in studio next year. You are going to – I'm going to – okay, that is recorded. Selection Sunday show. I, I got you recorded. You are going to be on the Selection Sunday show in 2020. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for listening to another episode of Off the Cuff. It is the March Madness series, and – This was a bonus episode I hope you enjoyed to talk about the coaching carousel with my good buddy Ryan Mullins. Be sure to tune in to the next episode of the March Madness series where I have my OTC sports panel, Chad Rainwater, Zach Hahn, and hopefully Jordan Knasser back in the studio to talk about the first and second round of the NCAA tournament. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm Adam Banks. This is Off the Cuff. I'll see you in the next episode.